Hey folks, welcome to Cosmos with Cosmos, The Shots. And today, here's two planetariums. <gasps> hey. Oh. Mm. oh, this is a good one. That was a strong thing. I told you. <laughs> what did you tell her? Not important. Oh, so you had to take a shot twice. Because she put too much in there. <laughs> Oh, gasp. Anyway, roll it. Well, did you know that this year, 2023, marks the 100th anniversary of the first modern planetarium? Yeah. Depending on how you want to describe that. That's right. Yeah, if you go to Germany, they have stamps out for the to marking the 100th anniversary. That's amazing. Yep. So, yes, in 1923, the Zeiss Model 1 lit up a dark room in Munich, Germany, with an accurate representation of the sky. Now... I'm kind of considering a planetarium being images on a ceiling representing the cosmos. Mm -hmm. But that was not the first time people tried to recreate the sky indoors. Ooh. So, uh, Liz, hit me up with a, a time machine effect. <gasps> diddle -oo, diddle -oo, diddle -oo, diddle -oo. All right, back in the year 1473 BCE. Oh, shit! Way back Way in the back. day, folks. This is wow. older than I am. 3,400 years ago. Wow. That was some fast math. An 18th century dynasty Egyptian architect statesman uh, named Sunamet died. Oh. Now, reading about Sunamet, um, he actually had a really neat life. So he became high stewards of the king. He a built the... A gondor, yeah. So I put steward in there. I thought you'd appreciate that. <laughs> uh, he built the high... Or he, he designed, I'm sure. Had slaves build. Uh, the highest structure of the world at the time. And had a number of other neat buildings around Egypt. Uh, but in any case, the ceiling of the tomb that he constructed for himself, I love that vanity, is divided, the ceiling, divided between a northern and southern sky. And so some of the notable constellations um, include Orion, the Big Dipper, Draco, uh, with the visible planets. Except for Mars. We're not quite sure why. Uh, maybe it was, in, honestly... Fuck that planet. Uh, <laughs> but maybe it's due to uh, retrograde. So Mars wasn't really a permanent position in the sky. Um, it's Maybe it was depicted as a boat. Or maybe because it was 3,400 years ago, it got smudged off. Who knows? Well, it was, yeah. <laughs> Fair. Uh, now, of course, there are plenty of other arts uh, depicting the sky, uh, you know, and pottery and other things. But this was the first known time the sky was put on a ceiling. So I'm calling that the first known planetarium protoplanetarium if you will okay and there are another of other protoplanetariums um and one includes after the cinnabit there the etruscans which if you know your roman history you know all about the etruscans uh they were a civilization on the western coast of italy uh mm -hmm. and they created the dome of the heavens which was a decent sized dome with painted little stars on it uh, but then, of course, they were, I keep saying, of course, they were destroyed by the Romans. So don't worry about them. Yes, they took over all the Italian city-states. And they, they tend to do that. Other, they plagiarized everybody's yeah. culture. And speaking places, speaking of places that the Romans took over, uh, we have 250 BCE, our buddy Archimedes. Hey. Uh, hey. He <laughs> finagled together. And this is quite a planetarium in my definition, but I thought it was worth you're talking about a metal globe with all the motions of the planet even with processions of the planets included oh, so that was a wow. really cool mechanism he was able to divide um in fact um it was so noteworthy that when the Romans took over one of the leaders said take what you want destroy what you want but i want this one thing i want to see what that is so oh, it was cool. it was that cool uh so if we fast forward another 200 some odd years we get to the domus aura latin for the Golden House. Uh, this was constructed during the reign of Nero in Rome. Oh, okay. Uh, what's what's Nero famous for? Fiddling. Fiddling. Yeah. Burning as Rome. Rome burns. Yes. yes. Uh, but of course, if you actually look into it, uh, he was not a fiddler and he was not in Rome while it burned anyway. Uh, but it's a fun idea. He had a, a number of other issues during his reign. Uh, but he did construct the Golden House, and which inside of this, the dining hall, the main dining room, uh, featured a dome over 50 feet wide, over 13 feet high, that constantly rotated uh, thanks to the motion of water. So they had like water somehow rotating this giant dome above them. Oh, that's cool. That's It's super cool. 
That's cool. All right. Okay. And it was, yeah. So that was probably the first like rotating dome versus rotating planetarium, thanks to Nero. And it was completed in 68 AD. Uh, he may have seen it a few times because that year he committed suicide because it turns out he wasn't the greatest emperor of all time. Uh, how many of them are? Uh, Augustus was great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you had you have the Pantheon about 60 years later that has, you know, some stars in the, the dome as well. Mm-hmm. At the Palace of Krosos near Baghdad, it was completed in 531 CE, featured an 85-foot high arc depicting the sky. Oh, So another okay. planetarium there. Uh, a number of other people, the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II had one. Tycho Brahe uh, tried to make one as well. And then the Try. Navajo... Well, Try. they quite had a... Okay, so yes You know, and Jep, no. Jep could only reach so high. Oh, God. <laughs> That's an inside cut. God, I, I wish you. I wish oh, I had a drink to drink to that God, one. God, we're going to cancel. No, uh, so Ty- 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 Tycho Brahe and Jep, of course, uh, they had, what do you call them? Um, tiny uh, spherical globes um, of the stars. What are they called? Ty- what? What? Tiny they, they, spherical uh, globes of the anyway, stars. Anyway, continue. Of, yeah. of the stars, yes. But in any case, uh, a number of other cultures, Navajo and Arizona, for example, created some planetarium with the ceilings as well. Uh, but that kind of brings us to the modern planetariums. And the cutoff of planetariums of the ancient type of modern planetariums is what I'm calling um, electricity. <laughs> that definitely makes a big difference. That makes yes. a big difference, yeah. the, the ability not only to paint the stars that etch them, uh-huh. Uh, but to show their movements <laughs> thanks to that electricity. Yeah. yeah. So the first projection device was likely the orbit scope in 1913, invented by Professor E. Hinderman with oh. springs and lamps. Uh, so it depicted the sun with just two planets that orbited the sun, but of course it had precession and all kind of stuff. Uh, but it wasn't the full planetary, no stars, just that one star and a couple of planets. <laughs> And that brings us to, right? Not, you, you could do better there, oh, let's go. Uh, but that brings us to Carl Zeiss Company. Ah, yes. So the Zeiss Company was approached by uh, the Deutsche Museum in Munich in 1913 to create a device that cast the sky in their museum. So Zeiss got together with a glassmaker, Otto Schott, to devise such a machine. Um, however, in 1913, these plans were delayed. Thanks to what do you think? World, World War Two. Uh, where are we? Great Depression. Thanks to thanks to the Great War, the World greatest War war, the war, war, war that will end all wars. Wait a minute, what year were we talking? About? I thought nineteen thirteen. Yeah, oh, nineteen thirteen. Yeah, World 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 War War. War. yes. World War. The, of, of course, as we know it, the war that will end all wars. Which didn't end theirs. Yeah, right. So, so they, they waited a little hot second. So after things settled down, the chief designer in the Zeiss company. Walter Bosfeld, he, well, he took five years of calculations with a huge staff, you know, scientists, engineers, mm-hmm. everyone. Um, and at the same time, they actually rediscovered some work by Christian Huygens uh, to, to create some math to track the sky as well, to create it very um, accurately. And so that led to the first machine, the Model 1, dubbed the Wonder of Jenna, which had first light in August of 1923, 100 years ago. With the first showing, October 21st, 1923. Was it the first, basically, star ball is what it's referred to in the planetary field? Well, so in this case, it was, it was, two, it was, it was two lobes, which oh, okay. you would still see at planetariums that are still older. It's not one lobe, there's two lobes mm-hmm. that tend to sag, but that's a different story. Um, so, yes, it was, two, it was lobes two lobes. Yeah, yeah, so my, my first one, my first planetarium uh, was a Minolta... MS-10 projector. It had two lobes. Oh. Minolta? Who, who did that? Was that Zeiss as well? Or who was that? It was Minolta. Minolta. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> Don't talk to me like that, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> I love how she's like, Minolta. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> he just said it. <laughs> yeah. And so I'll talk a little more about it. But let me tell you, these star balls, the way they depict the stars, like, it's beautiful. You can't get It is absolutely absolutely no, you can't. beautiful you can't you can't especially with especially the, the, the newer ones which are like the size of a small school bus oh my god they look great wait seriously no they're big they're fucking huge uh there's one in germany uh that they're trying to get rid of i want to buy it and just have it live in my apartment like that's it 
That's all I would have. And they go, yes, yes, all you have to do is uh, pay for shipping. No problem. But then you realize how big it is. It's like, there's no way. Oh, my God. Uh, but, yes, there are absolutely gorgeous works of art. Yeah, with, and and the amounts of mirrors and light inside of them, it's impressive. They're gorgeous things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that was 1923. Uh, but there were a few finishing touches still, and it became a permanent installment in uh, 1925 until oh. – uh, when do you think? Until – World it stopped. War II. It's still World War II. Yeah. It was actually removed from the Deutsches the Museum. The second war to end all <laughs> And then that museum was completely bombed, but the Star Bowl was still kept because it was removed. So, you know, oh. it works. Out. Good, good. Whew. And after that point, people saw the planetarium, saw the stars being projected on, on the dome, and they just couldn't be stopped. And now there are projectors all over the world. The first projector, planetarium projector in America was the Adler. And Chicago, also a Zeiss. Mm-hmm. Shortly, Ad- Adler has two things. You, you, they have the planetarium thing, right? Yeah. But um, you, there's also this big spherical thing you can go into. It's not quite spherical, but it does go all the way to the ground, which yeah. is a wonderful. It's not a pain, but it's a wonderful it challenge like, to get like right. Professor X's. Uh, uh... Similar. Okay. Yeah, yeah similar to that. <laughs> Uh, followed shortly by the Griffith in L.A., which I'll be at shortly, and the Hayden in New York. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And since then, there were many other projection, planetarium projection types, including whatever Mike said, the, what, is, what was it called? Minolta. Minolta. You have Minolta. You have Godo. You Godo. have um, Digistar. Keep going. Zeiss, you have Digistar. We'll you have Skyscan's got stuff. Digital's R- R- got stuff. RSA. RSA. RSA's got stuff. But, but, but RSA, that comes a little bit later, because right now, uh, what the, one of the first American projector companies was, of course, Spitz, with a Spitz, dodecahedron yeah. planetarium projector in 1953. Whoa. Uh, because this this is a fun one. The founder of Spitz was a, a newspaper man in, a, in a Pennsylvania, and he wanted to be able to bring planetarium stars to a cheaper uh, more affordable peoples, like to schools, for example, and other smaller museums. And so he made that uh, dodecahedron uh, projector, uh, Star Bomb, which is very neat of them. Nice. nice. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, and then about 30 years later, the world's first computer-based planetarium was developed by Evan Sutherland. We have the Digistar projection system. Hey! Yes. Evans and Sutherland were two people who were at the University of Utah, yeah, and they actually pioneered um, computer graphics, mm-hmm. and a lot of people worked for them that went on to found of people. Adobe, oh. um, Pixar, mm-hmm. and so the, well, like the Godfathers. We yes. the company that we work for is like the Godfather. <laughs> yes. this this is not a sales pitch. For, no, uh, no, for no. them at all. But uh, <laughs> but I mean, yeah. So. But there are so many and, plantations. And, and one of my favorite things. So you walk into the sorry the Evanson office, and you look to the left there. They have this collage of things they've done, including the the graphics to Star Trek II: Wrath of Khan, the Starfield, yes. and to Tron as well. It's just the coolest thing. <laughs> By the way, Did I made, made that? that. I was gonna. I was I like, made that. You oh, you made that? Oh, I, shit, made that. I made that. <laughs> <laughs> I, knew you, I knew you made the D6, Digizar 6 uh, graphics. I didn't know you made that big one. That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, I made the big one. That was, that was well done. So in any case, we've come a long way from handprints in the dome or, uh, you know, with Sunarets in Egypt, creating the northern southern hemisphere. And now we can just go travel the cosmos with the click of the button. So planetariums now see over 100 million people in a year around the world. And all we want to do, no matter... What company or what star ball it is? We just want to talk about space and shit. That's all we want. That's, That's all it is. Space and shit. So here's to you, planetariums. May you live for another hundred plus years. Cheers, planetariums. Cheers.